Tonight we're going to look and hear and talk and discuss about the founding and movement and development of what is rapidly becoming the major means of communication, not only in the United States, but elsewhere, the World Wide Web. And to lead our discussion with our guest of honor is another guest of honor, the Freedom Forum's Vice President for Technology Programs, out from Arlington, Virginia, here in person, not in virtual reality, as I sometimes see him, Adam Clayton Powell III. And I will turn the program over to Adam. Adam, welcome to San Francisco. Thank you, Felix. <laughs> Always good to be back in the Bay Area. Our guest tonight is Tim Berners-Lee, who is based at MIT's Laboratory for Computer Science. He is director of the World Wide Web Consortium, widely honored, named by Time Magazine as one of the top 100 minds of the 20th century, 1998 MacArthur Fellow. Tim Berners-Lee became famous worldwide because of a series of software programs that he wrote at the CERN Research Center in Switzerland, software which sometime, someday, shortly before Christmas Day of 1990, launched the World Wide Web. And that changed everything. That changed communication, education, commerce, the way we interact with ideas, the way we interact with each other. So welcome to the Freedom Forum, Tim Berners-Lee. Thank you. Now you've written a new book, Weaving the Web, in which you say about various published stories about how you invented the World Wide Web, quote, many accounts I've read have been distorted or just plain wrong. So if you can set the record straight for us tonight, how did you start the web? Well, if it was easy to put into one sentence, then I guess I'd have done that, and everybody wants me to put it into one sentence. Uh, the question is not, how did you invent the World Wide Web, but what was the moment at which it suddenly occurred to you? Uh, I think the reason that, that uh, a lot of accounts are misleading is they just start a whole lot later after. Uh, they start when the person who wrote the account actually first heard about the web. And when in fact it had the, what I started by describing them is the history when it was very unsure that it was going to change the world. Well, it was in 1989 and the internet already existed and that you could send email, but there was no websites, so there was no HTTP, there was no HTML, there was no space of things you could click through. And it began because I was frustrated it didn't exist. <clears throat> I imagined a system where you could just click from one to the other, and that was so compelling that I decided that I wanted to uh, build it. I'm proud of the spirit of collaboration, which was the last 25 years. You know, it wasn't just me. I had the idea, right? I invented it. And then, in fact, it was taken up by all kinds of people over the world. I get an email from somebody saying, hey, Tim, I've set up a web server with a dinosaur exhibit on it or something. Or, hey, I've got an art exhibit. And these people, you know, I didn't know them. Uh, and they all collaborate together. Trying to, and the, we have the World Wide Web Consortium where the people come, companies come. They're all trying to make the technology better, trying to make it a better basis for designing really cool websites. That spirit of international collaboration has been absolutely awesome for the last 25 years. If you actually think the power you have when you have a web browser compared to the power of somebody who doesn't, if you're starting a company, you want to start a company in New York, and you just you think of a name of a company, and you search for it on the web, and if the company or is already be, the names have already been thought of, ah, you try another one. You're in an African village, and you don't have a web browser. No, you can't do that. You can start a company, and then it isn't until <laughs> Long time later, you realize that somebody else has done it somewhere else. There's lots, you know, but lots of little things you, you do to do with health, to do with uh, just keeping a family together, communicating with friends. So the, the, so the difference in power between somebody who's got the internet and somebody, uh, somebody who hasn't is now huge. Also really important for democracy. If you are not connected to the internet, how is your voice going to be heard? How are you going to make sure that the values which you think are important are, going to, are being represented by all the governments out there? It's 25 years on. We need to think about the next 25 years to make sure that we establish these the principles that the web's being based on. Principles of openness, principles of privacy, principles of not being censored, for example. Hello, uh, my name is Evan. I work at Ripple on the Interledger Protocol. I'm going to go through. Today I'm going to be talking very quickly about Interledger and streaming payments. So I'm the co-inventor of Interledger. I've been working on it full-time for the past three years. 
So the problem that we want to solve is today, if you tried to go and actually use cryptocurrency for anything, you would have a situation like this. You walk into a grocery store, you say, hey, do you accept Ether? And they would say, what is that? No, sorry. Um, and the fundamental problem is that all of these different payment networks are disconnected. You can't use any kind of type of cryptocurrency today for payments because you need the other person to actually accept that cryptocurrency. Blockchains don't solve the interoperability problem by themselves. They, blockchains are individual networks that have the same problems as traditional ones where they're all disconnected. When you vote, have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled Fairtrade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, please visit iftf.org slash blockchain futures lab. What we need is a system for internetworking payment networks. And so this term internetworking comes from the internet. That's what, it, what it's named after. And at its core, the internet is all about routing little packets of data across independent networks. So what we need is a system for routing packets of money across independent payment networks. So what that would enable is me to pay you even if I have some kind of super obscure cryptocurrency and you just want dollars or whatever you want. So what Interledger does is it routes packets of money very similarly to how the internet routes packets of data. Um, I won't get into too much of how that works, but I want to walk through some of the cool things that this lets you do. So when we're applying this analogy with the internet, um, one of the things we get to is this idea of streaming payments. So if you broke up payments into little tiny chunks and could route these packets super efficiently, what you could end up with is this idea of streaming payments. So one of the things that could look like is, oh, you need to send a bigger payment? OK, it depends on your payment bandwidth, which is a weird concept that we that we work with a lot, where that would be measured in dollars per second that you can send, or whatever currency you have. Hi, I'm Tim Wan, Director of Innovation here at ATB Financial in Canada. We're the ninth largest financial institution here in Canada, with $43 billion in assets. We were the first Canadian financial institution to move real money to real FI across the ocean in near real time. We couldn't have done that without a pure SAP digital core banking platform. And we couldn't have done that with great partners such as Riza Bank and Frank Bobarak, who's the head of product there, and Ripple. Where that transaction from us to that German bank, Riza Bank, 
may have taken two to six business days in the past. It takes an average of eight seconds. I'd love to introduce you to my friend, Frank Boborak at Rise of Bank in Germany. Frank came to visit us here in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and we went to Banff and had an incredible party and an incredible time. But now that the party's over, I actually owe him a thousand dollars Canadian. Um, and I'd love to show you how that we send it to him right now. I have a thousand dollars Canadian loaded at a rate of 1.47 Canadian with a receiving fee of one euro. And that'll end up as 679 euros and change. Does that sound okay to you? That sounds quite good. So I'd love to send that. And now the payment's executed. Let's take a look at what's happening on the uh, Ripple Connect platform on Rise of Bank's administrative dashboard. And, and it's can, settled. Yes, and I can give con confirmation that the payment has been received and uh, is settled. The money has arrived in Germany. Thank you so much. Yeah, it takes eight seconds, is that correct? Yes, instead of four days. Great. And then we also have received confirmation here that payment has been sent and Frank has received it. Here's the email which states that the amount has been processed at Razba. Ripple provides a great platform for vertical integration, for new services to be built upon. We have an opportunity to seize the moment today and to do something tangible and real with this technology. Some of the cool use cases that come out of this, things like streaming media. So today you might, today payments are super inefficient and clunky, and so we'd prefer, you know, things like monthly subscriptions. I pay my $10 a month because I don't want to be bothered by this. If you made the payments super efficient and could do it on a very small basis, you could do things like paying for a second of video. So you're streaming me video, I'm streaming you money, and if I pause the video, I stop paying for it. If I walk away, I stop. If I come back and hit play again, keep streaming money, because it would be that efficient. Another cool thing that comes out of this is the idea of sign up list services. Today in the physical world, when you walk into a shop and you wanna, make, you wanna have some, some financial exchange, the exchange normally goes, I give you money, you give me good or service, and I walk out. I don't need an account, I don't need to sign up, things like that. Today on the internet, you always need to sign up for accounts because there's no way to do this very seamless, here's a little bit of money, you give me a little bit of service, rinse and repeat. As a business, for if you're giving me hosting services or something like that, you don't need to know who I am, you just need the money. And so with something like Interledger, you'd enable anybody to land money in your account, even if they're on some completely different payment network. So that would enable sign up list services. Another neat idea we've been playing with is the idea of a creative marketplace license. So the idea here is, today we have Creative Commons license, which is awesome. If you wanna give away your, your work, it's a really, really great project. One of the issues with Creative Commons is there's no way to have a license that's as easy to use where you can actually monetize your work. So the idea here is with something like Interledger, you could actually have a license that says, anybody can use this content, you know, feel free to, but for every download or view or whatever kind of interaction you wanna monetize, just pay me at this address. And the thing that's really missing today to, in order to do this is the assumption that just anybody could pay you. Because there's no interoperability and because we don't have internetworking for payments, if you did this kind of license, you'd be like, okay, anybody that has Bitcoin can now pay me, which is a tiny subset of everybody. The thing that makes the internet work is that everybody can access it quality. Last kind of fun thing to throw out there is if you connect every type of currency and payment network together, what you can enable is payments from weird currencies. So today you use dollars because everyone else accepts dollars here. Um, if everything's connected, you could pay with stocks, community currency, local currency, crypto, whatever you prefer. So I'll leave you with three questions to consider. Number one, which ledgers will be the most attractive when everything is connected together? What kind of features would you want? Number two, will, will interoperability bolster or kill app-specific tokens? And number three, what new businesses can you create with streaming payments? Thanks. The internet will disappear. Yeah. The internet will be, there'll be so many IP addresses because of IPv6, 
so many devices, sensors, things that you're wearing, things that you're interacting with, that you won't even sense it. It'll be part of your presence all the time. Those are some provocative words right now. So joining us now to break it down is Jag Bath. He's Senior VP of Products at Retail Me Not. Jag, what did Schmidt mean when he said the internet is basically going to disappear? Well, it's a bold statement for sure, but it's also a play in words. What he really means is he's talking about the way we used to access the internet and how we access it, access it, access it now and how that's changing. So we used to access the internet you know, by sitting at our desktop computers, connecting to the internet, surfing the web, but now our phones are connected, our cars are connected, our watches are connected, and everything in our home is connected. And so the act of actually physically connecting to the internet is changing. We're just connected all the time. And just to dig into that a little bit more, Schmidt said a, quote, highly personalized, highly interactive, and very, very interesting world will emerge. What does that mean? Does that speak to this Internet of Things? Yeah, for sure. When you're always connected, uh, you're sharing data when you're always connected. And so leveraging that data to push you information that is relevant to you is what he's really talking about.